In this episode, I am once again joined by Naomi Levine, author under her birth name Norma Levine, of multiple books, including The Miraculous Sixteenth Karmapa, A Quest for the Hidden Lands, and Chronicles of Love and Death, My Years with the Last Spiritual King of Bhutan. Naomi discusses her various publications about the Karmapas, focusing in particular on the lives and activities of the 16th and 17th of that line. Naomi discusses the magical powers and spiritual aura of the 16th Karmapa, recounts her own and others' experiences of his supernatural potency, and recalls the process of compiling stories of his miraculous activities. Naomi explores the controversies around the 17th Karmapa Ogyen Trinle Dorje, including his recognition, escape from Tibet, interactions with the Tibetan government in exile, and various accusations in the media. Naomi also speculates about the futures of both the Tibetan political cause and the Tibetan religious institutions after the death of the Dalai Lama. So without further ado, Naomi Levine. Naomi Levine, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you very much. I'm so delighted to be talking with you again. Today we're going to be talking about a strain or a, a vein of your work to do with the Karmapas. And you've written about them in several places. I think most notably the miraculous 16th Karmapa, which is a compilation of various different stories, your own and others that you've put together for Shangshung Publications, all about the stories of, of the 16th Karmapa, who was notorious for miracles and being a sort of field of spiritual experience and something you experienced yourself, and we'll talk a bit about that, but also your most recent book, A Twist in the Tale, three short accounts of your own life, um, which uh, much of which has to do with some, somehow or another, directly or indirectly, with the Karmapas. So I'm very pleased to be talking with you about, about that aspect of your work today. Thank you very much, Steve. Um... First of all, I want to correct you in using the word notorious. Um, I, can't, I can't let that slip by. I would say famous, but uh, yes, he was famous for his miraculous powers. He was, a, he was considered uh, in East Tibet, in, in Kham, where he was always born. Uh, he was considered like the king rather than the Dalai Lama. Historically, of course, now it's all changed. But um, yeah, he was, um, you know, a Buddha, uh, Mahasiddha. My uh, involvement, if you want to start that way, my involvement with the Karmapa started when I was uh, a very, very uh, uh, much at the beginner level, which I still am, of course, but it was many years ago that I met the 16th Karmapa in a farmhouse in the Black Mountains of Wales. And uh, that was uh, a, a turning point in my life. It was a pivotal event. It wasn't something that I was searching for consciously, uh, but I just happened to be there at the right time and the Karmapa came to town, uh, to Heon Moi, that is. Now, uh, something that's also very interesting about that uh, period is that he buried a uh, sacred object I think it was a bumpa, a ritual vase, uh, at the top of uh, the grounds uh, where we uh, had the ceremony. And he predicted that sometime in the future there would be a flourishing Dharma community. I think that's just about to happen, actually, because it hasn't happened yet, but there is a... Um, uh, a change going on in the ownership of that place. And I think it will bring about something uh, like more likely to fulfill that prophecy. So, um, and he named it as his last black acquisition, which is very interesting because he was known for the black pills. He was known for his um, um, black hat. And, uh, well, they also said he served black tea, but that's not something I experienced. <laughs> so so uh, it, it, was, uh, it was just good to know that he had planted something there. And, you know, it would be there for, for a long time. So 
that's um, now the 16th, the 16th didn't in terms of politics. This is also interesting is that he said, if I can find it at the beginning of this book, he said, I think I quoted Katya Holmes in the preface um, to the to the book. Uh, May the passing obstacles to the fullness of activity of the Buddha's representative in our world, the great Karmapa Ugyen Trinley Dorje, soon be removed, and may he have the freedom to perform the sacred activity of the Karmapas. Convinced that our own ignorance and negativity is a key factor in this removal, I wish and pray that we may all progress in that direction. Katya Holmes. And um, this was written uh, as part of her memoir of the Karmapas, of the 16th Karmapa rather, where she, um, in which she describes the 16th Karmapa as trying, being say, saying that he is very happy not to be in Tibet because in Tibet, he would not be free. He would be uh, a source of political, um, in, he would source of political interest. So he was quite happy even to extend it to the fact that he did not feel, um, that he wanted to go to Dharamsala, which was also a political place in his mind. So um, this is key in remembering uh, the stories that I put out in A Twist of the Tale, because he was, um, the Karmapas have always been a subject of great interest to political leaders from the time of Karma Pakshi, right on. Karma Pakshi was the first or second, you can say, Karmapa. Uh, and uh, Karmapa, Karma Pakshi was held by uh, Kublai Khan, who wanted to keep him in his palace and from whom he received uh, information from his um, Gidam deity that he had to escape. He had to get out. So he followed the, the invocations of his uh, personal deities and escaped from Kublai Khan, who never forgave him and, and uh, sought ways of um, imprisoning him again, which he actually succeeded in doing. So, so it seems to be that um, almost, uh, well, many of the Karmapas have been, in a sense, kind of almost persecuted by uh, the powers that be. The 16th was very fortunate in that he did get out of Tibet. He did stay away from politics and he told all his people uh, to stay away from politics and even including the Tibet cause, which is very alarming to hear now, but uh, that, that is true. Uh, so, because that, that um, overlap is completely destructive to the Dharma and to the Karmapa's activity, he never wanted to get involved in any of it. Now, that continued with the 17th Karmapa, big time, very much so. The 16th was relatively free because he came at the right time. Nehru was in power, Nehru welcomed him. Following Nehru, Indira Gandhi welcomed him as well. And uh, in fact, he was even uh, a source of um, um, like um, divination or you could say counselor to Indira Gandhi when she came to him. So he had the whole thing, you know, on a plate, if you like, freedom was there for him. He didn't, he didn't have to struggle for it. Which is why uh, his activity was so widespread. He could travel everywhere. He could bring the black crown with him. And I saw him perform it in this um, several times, actually, more than once. 
maybe even four times. And um, uh, it was liberation upon seeing uh, and supposed to confer freedom from the lower realms uh, for seven lifetimes. So anyway, the 17th was born under very different circumstances. He was born under occupied Tibet. And uh, there was a controversy right from the time that he was born about whether he was the Karmapa and that controversy was uh, dividing up the Kagyu school. And uh, it was a controversy initiated by one of the uh, main regents, the Shamar, and uh, uh, the 17th in the latter years that uh, he's been able to be a bit freer because he actually had to escape as well from Dharamsala. He's been able to uh, become uh, a line, not a line, but uh, meet with um, the other uh, so-called Karmapa, and uh, perhaps they have come to some arrangement because Karmapa wants to, 17th Karmapa wants to bring the Shamar back into the lineage. He's a very important figure, has been in the past, and he wants to make sure that the recognition of the next Shamar is the correct one, I think. So, uh, so, He's had a very difficult time with um, and become very controversial in the process through no doing of his own, I think. It's just the way things have happened. Uh, I think certain obstacles had to be cleared up. I don't know. Uh, I think we'll have to. Um, see what happens because he's been he was when he got to Dharamsala he expected something very different to what he got when he escaped from Tibet he escaped from Tibet because he didn't want to be um uh, a um a source of uh division against the Dalai Lama, which is what the uh, Chinese were trying to do with him. So he refused to speak out against the Dalai Lama. And then he found that his life was in danger. Uh, there were intruders that were spies that were probably trying to kill him. Uh, so he made his escape, which made the headlines all over the world for a long time. I can remember first reading about it in the Telegraph. And that headline kept going for well over a week. So because of the timing of the whole thing, it was the millennium. It was um, the fact that he went straight to the Dalai Lama in his mind in order to take blessing first from the Dalai Lama. And he thought he would be there for perhaps a few days before going to his guru's monastery down the road, Tai Si Tarimpshe's monastery, but that didn't happen. The Tibetan government in exile was very uh, uh, much into keeping him there for as long as possible for all kinds of reasons, one of them being that uh, they wanted to control him and uh, there was another reason, of course, is that the Shamar had spread rumors about him uh, getting being a spy for the Chinese. And so the Indian government also wanted to keep him out of Rumtek, out of his real monastery, which where he was supposed to end up. Uh, so that was one thing, uh, the Indian government uh, the uh, Tibetan government in exile who saw him as a great asset because he was a poster boy for the Tibet cause. He suddenly lifted the whole thing up, re-energized it, and it appeared like 
he had arrived at the very moment that the Tibet cause needed kind of, you know, reinvigorating. So he served uh, the purpose very well and they just were not too keen on him going. So he couldn't even, in order to satisfy both the Indian government and the Tibetan government in exile, and we never knew which one it was because it was constantly one saying it was the other and the other saying it was that one. So nobody could ever figure out really what was going on. And uh, he had to get permission every time he left the monastery, even to go down the road. So he spent 18 years in that kind of incarceration. Now here was a boy, he was 14 when he left, and he, um, he was used to being quite free in his own monastery in Tibet, at Serpu. There were uh, caves that he could go to meditate. Um, he even left uh, a handprint on the wall somewhere around there when he was very young. He had his own monastery, his own monks, but the point is he couldn't get his teachers there, his gurus there, from whom he had to receive the lineage again. And uh, he couldn't go out to them. So he had to make an escape from there. So he, he, um, he, he came expecting that he would only spend a few days there and go on to um, Sherabling, Sita Rinpoche's place. But uh, that never happened. And I can remember when he first arrived, he went on a, uh, a little tour of um, uh, Tsopema and uh, some of the other holy places around there, Bodh Gaya, Tsopema and so on. And I followed him on that tour. And I remember one point where we were sitting in beer school, outside beer school, there was a great big canopy there. And uh, he was there, Karmapa was there. I remember Sogyal Rinpoche was there. And there appeared in the sky, unmistakable Buddha eyes, very, very wrathful, very wrathful, like, like um, you, you, you couldn't mistake it. It was as clear as a photograph. In fact, I took a photograph of it, uh, which I can't show you right here, but uh, it's on Facebook somewhere. I put it up on Facebook. Uh, and uh, he was only like um, less than a mile away from Sherab Ling, but he was barred from going to Sherab Ling. So, so I interpreted that as uh, the wrathful, sign, a wrathful sign that something was not right. Uh, so uh, he finally uh, made his escape from Dharam Sal in 2000, in 2000 and uh, what was it, 2018 when he came to London, then he went on to Europe and uh, he just stayed away. Just stayed away. He didn't go back. He would not go back. And he still will not go back until he gets assurance from the Indian government that he will be allowed his freedom if he goes there. So I think that's a work in progress. He will get there one day. But right now he's kind of, uh, his whereabouts are not exactly known. Uh, and uh, that's the way he wants it. So he has been maneuvered, manipulated, and uh, conspired against from the time he was recognized as Karmapa. I went to that ceremony, by the way, as well in Tibet. And uh, it was um, something I'll never forget. Uh, the Chinese officials were there. He was, he was called a living Buddha, hailed as a living Buddha. And that was the first time the Communist Party ever, you know, acknowledged anyone in that way, any, any Lama in that way. So he was a very precious treasure to them because he 
according to them, they would keep him and he would, um, you know, the Tibetans would just uh, follow along. So you could say that the Karmapa was like the jewel in the crown, like the Kohinoor diamond that everybody wanted. That's, that's, that's the way I think of it. And uh, I even met once when I was doing a travel story, uh, I was in Ladakh staying at the Shambhala Hotel and I got into a conversation with the uh, hotel manager who had been part of the kind of cabinet in Dharamsala in the, in the government in exile. And I was uh, pretending not to know very much uh, because I was writing a story. So I sort of cast myself as the journalist and uh, we started talking about the arrival of the, you know, Karmapa and the sort of purori it had created, you know. Uh, and uh, I said, well, how long do you think he's going to be in Dharamsala? Thinking he had already been there about six months at that time. And I thought, well, it's high time he got out. Um, and uh, he said, oh, it would be good if, you know, we had him for five years. Uh, and I was aghast because I realized that, and I even said to him, do you not realize that you're trying to manipulate a Buddha and prevent his activity? And he was startled. He never thought of it that way. So this is really something that's interesting. Tibetans aren't necessarily really Buddhist. They're in the sense that, you know, many Christians are Christian, but do they really... Um, adopt the precepts of Christianity. You know, they're born Buddhist, that's all. They're born Buddhist, but they know nothing about it. And uh, not to have that kind of respect for the Karmapa. Well, I was, I was, um, I, was a, I was just appalled, really, but I kept my stance and stayed a little distant from the whole thing at that point time because I didn't want him to realize that I was a, an ardent devotee. So then I knew that it was, you know, it had been thought of in advance very carefully, probably, or perhaps when he got there, it was just, you know, suddenly occurred to them, they had him, you know, they'd captured a great prize. So I'm very cynical. So I have to say this out front, I'm very cynical about the whole political uh, story. Politics and Dharma do not go together at all. So um, it's like uh, it's like church and state. You know, the, the church and the state here are separate, I believe, you know, and uh, the, uh, the state rules over the church. Um, well, in Tibet, they had never separated in the person of the Dalai Lama. He was both church and state. He was both king and um, spiritual leader. So I think he has uh, separated it now because, uh, you know, the regency after he dies is given over to a... Uh, Prime Minister, but I don't even think that Tibet will, you know, I, I don't think there's any hope and I don't think there's any going, uh, the Dalai Lama is obviously not going to be able to go back there in this lifetime. And I think when he goes, it's the end of the whole story. Anyway, um, you better ask me another question now. <laughs> Could you say a little bit more about what you mean by that, that when the Dalai Lama goes, it's the end of the story. Which story is it and how do you think it'll unravel? Oh, I think I think it's the end of uh, the Tibetan government in exile when the Dalai Lama goes. Um, it's the end of the Tibet cause, I think. Many Tibetans apparently are moving back to, um, to Tibet from Dharamsala because they know that the end is nigh and uh, and some of them are moving to Europe, some of them are moving to Canada. Dharamsala was, was given uh, by the Indian government to uh, the Tibetan, to the Dalai Lama, I guess, you know, 
um, but I think it'll just be a tourist place. So, I mean, without the Dalai Lama, the Tibet cause just will not exist anymore. So it's gone. That's what I mean. It's gone. It's 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 out of the hands of the Tibetans to do anything to change it, unless something totally extraordinary happens with the Karmapa. Because I can remember Thai Sita Rinpoche when when we were at the uh, enthronement in Serpu, uh, he said that. Uh, Karmapa was born in Tibet to help Tibetans. So we just have to wait and see. So it's possible that Karmapa ha may have a hand in a completely different way, not political, but in a completely different way in interacting with the Chinese. And that would help Tibetans enormously. Yeah. So I'm 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 uh, I'm glad I remembered that because I think that is the only way that it can go. It can't go. The the politics is is finished. It's consumed itself. It it can't it can't live any longer. And given how linked the religious institutions are directly or in you know indirectly to that cause or under that sort of general umbrella, that identity and that movement and all that it entails, what do you speculate will be the consequences for the various different religious organizations and gompas and shedras and so on that have sprung up under that umbrella? I think they'll still be there. They will continue nonetheless. I don't think, you see, none of, none of there's, there's different schools, first of all. And those schools are all in, independent of each other. So the, the monasteries in India and everything, all that will, will continue unless the Indian government under Modi says that they want the land back or something like that. I mean, it, it's, I think most of it still belongs to the Indian government. They could take it back. I don't know, that's, that's the only thing, but I don't think, I don't think monasteries will stop because the Dalai Lama is no longer there. No, they will continue. They have their, you know, they, they have their practice, their lineage, their tulkus, their everything, their, their own um, methods of survival and everything that goes along with it for an institution. The Dalai Lama may not even uh, reincarnate as the Dalai Lama. Because if there's no more Tibet, what's the point of being a Dalai Lama? He might reincarnate as another kind of person, uh, another kind of uh, important person, but he won't be a Dalai Lama because uh, Dalai Lama has to do with, uh, the, the, the title itself has to do with Tibet. And it was a title bestowed by one of the uh, Mughal um, overlords. So I hope this is not, this is going to be controversial, actually. Uh, um, I'm not intending it to be, but it's just going to invariably end up um, in a lot of commentary. But, you know, let it be. What do you anticipate the key points of controversy to be? Uh, Probably most people don't realize the important role that the Tibetan government in exile played in um, in the Karmapa's uh, activity, in blocking his activity. Uh, I'm not the only person who thinks this either, but it's not well known because nobody wants to think of the Dalai Lama as particularly being put placing politics above Dharma. Do you see what I mean? And if that did happen, did it happen with his knowledge, consent, initiative, 
who knows i cannot answer that cannot answer it it's you know it's so shrouded the whole thing is so shrouded that any any time i uh, suggest um like for example to one of my friends who does investigative stories you should definitely do an investigation on uh what's been going on with the 17th karmapa and he says he couldn't possibly unravel that story because to do a proper investigation you'd have to use uh chinese information indian information tibetan information who is going to be straightforward with you anyway see what i mean there's no transparency at all sadly but you know as kipling said east is east and west is west and never the twain shall meet so uh in that respect it's another culture and they've been doing things that way for a very long time <clears throat> i i i i put this all on one side when it comes to dharma <clears throat> you know this goes along with it but you can you know push it away as much as you want and get into your own practice still because the lineages are alive and they are um there are great masters who are still around so let's hope that that continues so that's the karmapa's um story he is now he is free so called free but he doesn't really have he has a dominica passport now dominica is a very small island somewhere in the caribbean it's not the dominican republic it's dominica which is a commonwealth country so he had to obtain that in order to travel anywhere um of course you know of course he would like uh another kind of passport i think but um he was stopped from getting an american passport by oh, i understand those same powers so uh uh he'll get out of it he'll get out of it it's like it's just like uh karma pakshi you know he was locked up but he walked through the walls well i'm not saying karmapa is going to walk through walls 17th karmapa but he will untangle it's a gordian knot he will untangle it that's in a way it's the you know it's what he has to overcome in this lifetime every bodhisattva has to overcome something to get you know to achieve a uh, perfect buddhahood <clears throat> and um he's been given this like a like a task like a heroic task to untangle the whole knot perhaps even expose it um i know that he's uh, very close with the dalai lama so i'm not doubting that for a second um and um all the tibetans think of the dalai lama as their uh king almost all and uh uh they rely on him tremendously tremendously it's you know more important than our monarchy you know he is the king he's the king so that's what they cling to uh and uh oh well we'll see what happens shall i tell you how this book was created the um miraculous 16th karmapa how it came into being yes it was during the time that i was a blog writer for the uh, kagyu munlam in uh, bodh gaya and um it was the about to be the celebration of the 900th anniversary of the karmapas 900 years uh and uh, i had already asked people if they would like to hand in a few stories for the blog 
about their personal experiences with the Karmapa, 16th Karmapa, that is. Uh, and I got some very good replies. I got about, I don't know, eight or 10, something like that. And then I suddenly had the idea, well, maybe I should turn it into a book. So I asked the 17th Karmapa uh, if, uh, if he gave me his permission to do that, if he thought it was a good idea. And he said, yes, yes, you know, go ahead and do it yourself, you know, do it yourself. So uh, it just uh, took over, it just, it just, somehow I put it out there. I think I, I think I put it out on the blog, hand in your stories, just write a, write a story and let me have it please for the book, for the celebration and it will be an offering to His Holiness the 17th Karmapa. <laughs> So the stories rolled in and, and I was amazed, actually truly amazed at the, uh, how interesting they were and how um, personal and just like uh, fresh. It was still fresh in everyone's mind. Everyone, every had, you know, all the details were there. So, I thought when I was, uh, you know, thinking over this uh, podcast, I thought, which ones do I like the most? And I came across a few that I have to say, um, really impressed me. Uh, if you look at uh, DD Contractors, not page 96, there's a very short story when time and eternity met, it's a very compelling story. The black hat ceremony. Do you see that? I do. I'll say, I'll say this. I mean, the writing itself is extraordinary. She's a very good writer. Um, Edie contractor. She's died now. Hmm. Um, so, um, it starts with my memory of the black hat ceremony sponsored by the Ambedkar Buddhist community during the Karmapa's visit to Bombay seems to have expanded over time to encompass the emotional essence of all those glorious sunsets that consistently moved my heart throughout the years when my home was on the shore of the Arabian Sea. The grounds on which the ceremony was to take place adjoined the burning ghats at Worli, a seaside suburb of the city. Astrologically, it was a dark night one of the times of extremely low tide, which left a huge expanse of polished sand that reflected the sunset. You could see in every direction. I remember the Karmapa's back was to the sea as he faced us from his throne. In the background, the huge expanse of shining beach water. To one side, corpses burned on funeral pyres, each arising from a luminous reflection of its consuming fire. People filed in with the funeral processions to the sound of conscious and calling out Hey Ram from the, from the windows of the city's tall buildings to the south. The reflection of the setting sun blazed as though the buildings were filled with destructive fire. Fire and water, the edge of the day and the edge of the sea, the conjunction of moon and sun near the solstice, which divides the halves of the year. It could not have been more propitious. The black hat ceremony is an epic drama. One understood the depths to which drama could go and the extent to which ritual can dramatize the divine. In Ganesh Puri, in the smaller but very charged sacred setting where we all chanted daily, the black hat ceremony had suddenly filled with an explosively strong energy. Here on the seaside, that energy seemed to extend boundless beyond the ocean's vast horizon into infinite space. Time seemed to stop as His Holiness lifted the black hat aloft, poised it above his head, and then placed it crowning his head, holding it there while the horns maintained a clear, high, piercing crescendo. To feel universal love and compassion in the midst of the mourning of the figures coming into the burning ghats, you knew this is it. 
you could not get more than that. It seemed to reveal what the burning gats were about. Mortality as a moment in eternity, a moment of utter transformation. The sun slipped into the glowing sea. As dusk descended, the first stars came out. In that huge crowd of maybe thousands, many people must have been as moved by that transfixing moment as I was. Some people from the Ganesh Puri Ashram also came and caught the color and drama with this huge orange sun background of the sunset. It was a transcendent moment, the depths of which could only be experienced. One perceived the immensity of the Karmapas, touching the deepest core of the identity when one's striving to, meet, to reach, the spiritual understanding in which all things outside of me, what we call reality, the sort of history that comes and goes, becomes a play. When you experience that immense sense of play, everything else becomes a little trivial. As a teaching of what stands above the different hells and realms given in the midst of a scene when this is, was actually embodied, it became a moment of live drama, a moment in which reality and myth come together. In Christian theology, it's the crossing of time and eternity. I think of the Karmapas as producers of such moments. I sense the 17th Karmapa as bursting with the capacity although he's not allowed to go and visit anyone or just hang out as a person, whereas the previous Karmapa could move freely and come, as he had, to my house and offer all these gifts. He could take personal care, and he did. He was a very motherly man. The Karmapa gave me a way to see greatness. When His Holiness was leaving Bombay, we visited him in his railway car to see him off. I was standing at the back of the group that was crowding in for blessing. He called me to come forward and motioned me to sit at his feet. He put his foot, shod in heavy black leather, onto my lap and rested it there for the whole darshan, as though I had become his living footstool. Feeling an immense space opening within my being, I drifted into an extraordinary state. This experience was a powerful blessing, much more than one reserved, deserved for having had the privilege of taking part in the meeting of the Siddhas. I stumbled out as though drunk on champagne onto the railway platform and watched the departing train gain speed and rattle away beyond sight. How's that? <laughs> yeah, amazing. 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 And there's a, there's a few stories of that caliber in there, and mm. you know, so even even reading, you know, going over that book now gives me the shivers. What do you think is the, or how is it that the sixteenth car mapper, for example, was able to manifest such experiences and had such powers? You you have it's not the only lineage of powerful tulkus that you've had contact with in the last. In the last interview, we talked about your relationship with the Shabdra in, That's in right. another um, magical person from a, a line of, of, of magical tulkus, you could say, or tulkus with magical capabilities, let's put it that way. So what do you think it is about, do all lamas uh, after a certain point, do all people beyond a certain point uh, attain those kind of powers and potencies, and, or is there something unique to the way in which the Karmapa moved in those realms and if so is it the particular lineages or teachings that he held or some other other thing what do you ascribe to the cause of that i've lost count of how many people i've heard say he looked at me across a crowded black hat ceremony and that was it you know i just uh, he, he seemed to be able to induce these transcendent experiences and engender instant conversion actually in in all sorts of people so what what's going on there do you think how is he so potent how was he so powerful? Well, he had many thousands of years <laughs> to, uh, uh, you know, I mean, there is, I can't remember the name of this book, Sakrachupa and uh, 
um, something or other. It's a story of, of a previous Karmapa that he recalled before the lineage of Karmapas even began, that he was driving through a particular place in quite near where they were driving at that time, Sakrachupa and Zal Zalangara and Sakrachupa. I don't know if you can even get the book, but you could look it up, in which he recalled uh, being um, a king at that time and uh, giving giving the driver of the car an opportunity to listen to the story that suddenly came to his mind as they were driving through this area of beer or or Lucknow or somewhere around in that area and it was from it was from a very very distant time that it suddenly came into his mind so you know, the, the Buddha predicted that um, the Karmapa, the coming of the Karmapa. So let's say some beings like the Karmapa have been around before they were Karmapa, of course. They were, they were something else. They were called something else in another time space. Um, and it's, uh, I don't know how. I mean, they say everyone can become a Buddha. We're all we're all sort of heading in that direction if we're if we want to. Um, it's kind of he's so far beyond um, that 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 point where uh, you can sometimes not even think that he's he's an ordinary being, uh, or he was even an ordinary being. It's. The, the look that, 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 that he gives people that changes their whole life is the look of somebody who is sees through all dimensions and realities and has penetrated the heart of uh, omniscience. Omniscience, and he's um, present fully in the present at the same time. So he is, you can see it, you can feel it. That's it, it's, it's, it, it's the feeling that it engenders and it's the feeling that opens up your heart and makes you realize something about yourself you never realized before. It gets to a part of you that has never been reached before. It changes people's lives, surely it does, yeah, for most people. Not everyone, of course, not everyone takes away that experience. It's very strong. Um, and I actually don't know anyone else who has it. Even seeing the 17th Karmapa does that to me as well, at times, at times. Um, I, I find him like, you know, although his life has been so different, you know, the events of his life and the and the circumstances, causes and conditions have been so different for him. But for me, he's actually the same as the 16th. Some people get caught up in the controversies, you know, in the in the um, in the stories uh, that uh, circulate uh, about him. But I'm not even interested in it. It doesn't matter to me. It, it, it's just like, it's, um, I can't put him into the same category as anything, anyone other than Guru Rinpoche. Guru Rinpoche being, being um, you know, the, uh, well, the avatar, I call him, but uh, that has a different meaning now. But he was, he was a, an Indian avatar who, you know, firmly placed uh, Buddhism in Tibet. So I can't, I can't see Karmapa as any different from someone like that, like Guru Rinpoche, and like the 16th Karmapa. I don't know how these powers happen, but, you know, it's certainly to do with meditation. It's certainly to do with uh, an intact lineage of um, transmission. And it's uh, certainly to do with many, many, many lifetimes. You're talking, I suppose, about 
certain controversies of being accused of having fathered a child as a monk and um, yeah. paying off the mother and so that sort of thing. That's yeah. been international news too, hasn't it? That has been that has been in not not in the uh, proper newspapers. Let's say I've never found it in any proper newspaper. Um, I uh, I have a very uh, unorthodox, but not entirely my own opinion about it. Uh, now I see if I can explain this properly. Um, if any of that is true, it simply rests as an allegation for one thing. There is no actual paper proof proof that he is the father of that child, although they do say that he gave his DNA and it matched. But who says that? And where is the document that proves that? Where is the document that proves that he sent money to uh, that woman? It's all allegations, as far as I can see. And uh, those uh, allegations are believed by some people. But the way I see it is that the uh, it's a, it was if any of it is true, and I'm not saying it's not true. I'm just saying if it any of it is true, it was a setup. It was a honey trap that was set up by, I would say, the Chinese. The girls involved are all Chinese origin, although they're not living in were not living in China, but they were Taiwanese. And uh, he could have uh, fallen for it. Okay, so if it is true, that's for me what it was. It was a setup because there were so many setups that were previous uh, to this one, where. Um, for example, he was accused, or his monastery in um, uh, at Guto was accused of concealing foreign currency in in the form of yuan, which Chinese devotees had brought as offerings out of Tibet, and they had not done the right thing by it because they hadn't put it into a foreign currency account. That cre created a great hue and cry. You know, somebody was out to make trouble for him from the beginning, not just one person, maybe a convergent, a convergence of forces made everything difficult for him from from that time in that in that period of time. And I think it continues. I think these these women were all set up now because of the Me Too movement. The female devotees, some of them, have taken more uh, more exception to this and believe the women. I don't. I don't. I don't believe the women, not for a second. So I'm not a Me Too devotee. I believe there are cases, of course, where it is true. It's true, but in this case, to believe that the, to even think for a second that the Karmapa forced himself on a woman who was in retreat uh, and uh, gave her a, a child uh, immediately and with the monk standing outside the door, uh, it just doesn't figure. I can't compute that. Uh, I can't, I can say that it's possible that they did have some kind of relationship. Uh, it's possible, it's possible, it's not impossible, but considering all the factors that have happened so far in his life, I would say if that is true, then it was all part of an ongoing honey trap in which the Chinese wanted to discredit the Karmapa so that uh, there would be no successor to the Dalai Lama. So that's my take on it, I have to say. But it's not, um, it's the only thing that makes sense to me. And I'm not ruling out the fact that there was something going on, it's possible. But if there was, uh, it was designed, designed. 
so take it or leave it it's just a it's just a, another factor in the whole thing yes i i must confess i'm not really informed enough to probe beyond that any further it, um, it, there's no need really mm -hmm. uh, i mean there's there was a document the only document i saw uh, that was a legal document was that they uh, they were also this woman was also suing um, uh, KTD for um, this transgression of a nun in retreat and there was a document uh, a legal document saying that that there was that the accusation was completely dropped somewhere along the way this whatever her name is Vicky Hahn uh, dropped the whole thing it's been dropped whether that was a payoff a change of heart a uh, a whatever i don't know but she dropped it don't know more let's move on it's it's one of the things it's one of the things that happened to karmapa out of many things you know, he's even given a very strong teaching now on Mikyo Dorje, the eighth Karmapa, in which Mikyo Dorje was first of all denied as the true Mikyo Dorje, in which he was also bad mouthed by uh, many of the people around him, creating a controversy about with, within the um, Nyingma, I think. Uh, you know, he had to constantly ride ride those waves and rise above it and prove himself, which he did in the end. So I see it in a bigger perspective than me too. Me too. No, it's not, it's not, it's not in the same category at all. I don't think he would take advantage of a woman. So shall we move on to um the Shabdrung story? A twist in the tale is, as I mentioned before, three stories in in that in that your latest publication. Maybe you could say a little something about about the other stories. I understand there's also one about the Shabdrung there. Yes, that's the other. It's almost a companion piece to uh, the Karmapa story. Interestingly enough, they had very uh, uh, similar, um, to some extent, similar circumstances, similar things happened to them. Um, the Shabdrung, uh, of course, uh, was in was in Bhutan and uh, living in exile in India when I when I was involved with him, and he was um, not able, really not unable, not able, unable to really fulfill his activity. He didn't have the causes and conditions in which to fulfill it. It's, it doesn't just happen. It's not just like pouring water from one, from the jug into the glass. It's a, it's a much more, uh, depends a great deal on causes and conditions, whether they manifest or not. So he didn't truly, in my opinion, when he was with me, he didn't manifest much except other people thought he had. Anyway, um, so when he, when he passed away in India, he passed away from natural causes, which was the first time that that had happened for several generations because he had already always been assassinated at least, at least twice, at least twice, if not three times. So uh, that was good, you know, to pass away from natural causes. And then, um, there were uh, reportedly miracles after his passing. But then when it came to the recognition of, of the uh, child, his labrang didn't want to take any chances. He was, um, he had to be found in secret so that the Bhutanese government would not know about it because they had assassinated the one before not the one I was with, but the one before that and before that. So he, um, so the abbot of the monastery went to the oracle. The Shabdrung had his own oracle in Bhutan and the oracle told him 
don't just take what I say, go to the Karmapa, and that way you will be like, you know, it will be sealed, it will be accepted, you know, because nobody will doubt the word of the Karmapa in terms of recognition. So they went to the Karmapa, although the oracle gave them quite a, a great deal of information about uh, his recognition, but he couldn't, he couldn't uh, really place it. He's here, he's here, these are the signs, these are the signs. So they went to the Karmapa. The Karmapa said, I haven't done any recognition since I got out of uh, Tibet, but because the Shabdrung is such a great um, and uh, important Lama, uh, I will do my best to help. So none of this is known at all. Uh, I um, found out from his labrang then that he uh, wrote three little letters uh, describing where to find him, <clears throat> explaining where, in which place to open the letters, giving lots of details. And uh, they followed the uh, signs that were given in the letters, doing everything correctly. And in the meantime, making constant prayers. The Karmapa told me you have to make 10,000 prayers this, 10,000 prayers that. The monks were performing prayers all the time before he would uh, get a sign. And um, so finally they found a child who had, uh, according to one of the letters, a dragon mark on the back of his head, the mark of a dragon. And uh, then they went back to the oracle and asked the oracle, is this the right child? The oracle said, yes, but you must ask Karmapa. So they went to Karmapa and Karmapa confirmed that this was the right child with the right signs and also when to take him out of Bhutan, both the Oracle and the Karmapa agreed on what the timing was for that. So you could say that uh, then uh, the Karmapa and the Oracle worked secretly, kind of hand in glove, to recognize a, a very, this was a very controversial recognition because the king of Bhutan is very powerful and, uh, and he's a Buddhist king and he is very close to most of the lamas. He has a good relationship with most of the lamas. And uh, I don't, think that this current uh, or the last two kings were bad people, but in their uh, lineage, their hereditary lineage that they established, that throne was soaked in blood that they had taken away from the spiritual king and continued to kill the reincarnations um, thereafter. Well, then this child suddenly appeared and they were, they found out about it. They wanted to verify the recognition. And so they asked the Labrang, the administration in India, please send over so we can verify the recognition. They duly performed that, although they knew how dangerous it was. And uh, from that moment, they said, he's not the, he's not the, reincarnation of the Shabdrung, but they put him under house arrest. And uh, the Oracle was put in prison for a year. So uh, what does that mean? Of course, it means that the um, hereditary monarchy wants to kill off the spiritual um, uh, king. And uh, they will do so in any way they can. I don't think they're going to kill this one. I think that time is gone, but they will um, keep his activity down to uh, a bare minimum. Unless things change, and they can always change. You know, any country can change, have a revolution, whatever. 
I don't think they will, though. But I, I you know, that's um, that's the, the uh, final story. Um, I went there. I was in Bhutan. I saw it for myself. Uh, it's a beautiful country. I mean, it's it's stunning. The environment is stunning. But knowing what I knew about it, I couldn't see it quite the same way as a tourist. Uh, I I did meet. Um, quite a few people uh, who knew something about the story uh, and they still had pictures on the wall of uh, the uh, the spiritual king, the Shabdrung. Uh, and uh, um, but they liked their they liked their king. They were satisfied with their current king. They weren't dissatisfied, but there were there was a lot of poverty and alcoholism and um, repression. So they had made a, a regulation that uh, the successor to the Shabdrung could not be recognized by anyone outside of Bhutan. So they were very similar to the Chinese in terms of. Um, political, uh, you know, maneuvering. So this is my take on gross national happiness. And <laughs> it's a good mantra. <laughs> it's, it, uh, it dulls the mind. And then when you see how beautiful it is, and well manicured uh, and so on, then you think, yeah, it's great. What a wonderful Buddhist country, nice people. And it is at the same time, but um, the backstory is a bit, now everybody says, well, you know, we certainly have a very brutal history as well in this country. And I don't know any country that was made into a country without brutality. But uh, when it comes to assassinating a, a bodhisattva, that is considered a heinous deed. And um, there's no getting away from the fact that anybody who does that is committing a serious, uh, a heinous deed. I mean, you know, for which you could go to what's called Vadra Hell. So according to the books, that's what the Bhutanese um, hereditary monarch, how it was established. So I find this a little bit um, uh, out, of, uh, out of sync with gross national happiness. I wonder perhaps as a final question, you mentioned before you're able to keep the politics and your own personal religious practice separate. Um, but I think that's not easy for many to do. I think uh, a greater awareness of history and politics can sometimes a little bit tarnish the idealism maybe on, upon which the religious uh, practice is based. Um, I'm, of course, aware of the uh, amusing contradiction of uh, a religious practice designed to remove delusion contingent upon a certain degree of idealism. I'm aware of that. Uh, but how is it that you're able to, uh, could you maybe say something, could you perhaps say something about that? How it is you're able to separate what you know about all the politics and the stories and the dramas and so on from your own religious practice? I don't find it difficult because um, I only connect with a very few lamas uh, very few, and I have complete confidence in them. And even though I can see the politics around them, and some of the um, attendants are, you know, uh, don't help either. You know, they have their their own problems, and they they can manipulate the the guru because they're very close to the guru. Anyway, all that I just think uh, we're still very fortunate because we still have the lineages intact. And even though Tibetan Buddhism is a um, 
uh, a mine of politics. Uh, and, and that's not the fault of Westerners that was already there in Tibet. So I, I don't feel responsible for it. I think the more you see, better it is. Look around you and see where you are in this, you know, in this, in these uh, six realms and be grateful that you were born a human being with, with all your intelligence and your faculties intact and that you have an opportunity to practice Dharma and get somewhere in this lifetime and uh, just get on with it, get on with it. Just see what, what, you know, what you've been given and try to make the best of it and don't go into, don't go into that side too much. I mean, I know all about it, but it doesn't, it just makes me wary, okay? I'm just wary, but I don't take that with me into the practice. Anyway, it's, I think it's because I've seen the real thing, the real deal. So I know what the real deal is. And I know what the real deal isn't as well. And so I don't go there. You know, I'm very choosy. Uh, there's only certain empowerments I will take, certain teachers I will go to. Um, uh, I'm, I'm pretty canny. But you know, the veils have been removed from my eyes and I'm, it was a long process. I was disillusioned for a while, uh, but uh, there's nothing more important than um, understanding that we're in samsara and that we keep uh, a firm uh, hand on the reins and try to drive the horse through <laughs> the whole thing keep bearing in mind that we've only got this this lifetime really to either go up or down so take your pick if you want to stay in the trenches and cover yourself with with rubbish i mean yeah you can do that as well you can throw it all away tell me levine thank you very much pleasure Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.